In this programme, we visit the traditional Mount Nebo, from which Moses viewed the promised land before he died. He climbed this mountain shortly after he had written the book of Deuteronomy, which, by the way, contains some remarkable information on how to live longer and how to enjoy good life. The hill over there on which there is a church built is Mount Nebo and it may not look very imposing from here but from the Jordan Valley where Moses ascended from it's 1,000 metres up to the top and from the top we get a very fine view of course. We can see right out over the Jordan Valley, you can see on the left the Dead Sea and in the distance on a fine day we can see the hills of Judea and uh, Jerusalem even crowning the hills. Would you like to know how to live longer and enjoy it? Well, I've got good news for you. Moses, in the book of Deuteronomy, tells us we can live longer, and he tells us how to do it. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, and in verse 40, he says, You shall therefore keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you today, that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. So there you are, you can live longer. Well, what's the secret of it? It says in chapter 7, it shall come to pass because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them, the Lord will take away from you all sickness and will afflict you with none of the terrible diseases of Egypt which you have known. Now, there was nothing arbitrary about this. It wasn't that God was saying, listen, I'm going to make all the other nations sick and I'm going to make you good and strong and healthy. This was a case of follow the rules and you'll reap the benefits. Don't follow the rules and you'll reap the consequences. Let me just give you a few simple illustrations of this. You've heard of the proverb or saying, cleanliness is next to godliness. Heard that one? It's not actually a quotation from the Bible, but nevertheless, the Bible certainly does teach that we need to have cleanly habits. For instance, in Exodus and in chapter 19 and in verse uh, 10, then the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. Well, you see, cleanliness is next to godliness and if you are hygienic and keep yourself clean, well, naturally, you're going to avoid some of these skin diseases which people get. And there's some other rules here too. Now, you listen to this very simple one in Numbers chapter 19 and in verse 15. Every open vessel which has no cover fastened on it is unclean. Now, that's quite important, you know, because you leave a vessel, whether it's a pot or a dish, some food, and it's uncovered, well, it's not long before the flies sit on it, it's going to be contaminated. That's the way disease spreads. So, God told the Israelites, follow these simple rules and you won't have some of these problems. Now, here's another very practical one, listen. In Deuteronomy 23 and in verse 13, you shall have an implement among your equipment and when you sit down outside, you shall dig with it and turn and cover your refuse. Now, there's a lot of diseases in the East. I've seen the people of India, for instance, out in the morning, you know, out to the paddy fields. They just uh, go to the toilet there. They just leave it. The flies come swarming over it. And the next thing, they're back in the windows and sitting on the food. That's why there's so much cholera, typhoid, amoeba, dysentery. Well, here's some good instruction practical instruction and Moses told the people follow this instruction and you will avoid the diseases that are so rampant among the other nations. 
Now, what I have told you so far is probably nothing new to you. I'm sure you've all got nice, clean, hygienic kitchens. But you've got to remember it wasn't always that way. You know, people never dreamed that disease could be carried on the legs of flies. But of course, we know that now. And so we can see that this instruction just has to be inspired. Moses certainly didn't get it from the Egyptian doctors. It must have come from God. And that should give us a lot of confidence in the rest of the instruction that he's passed on to us. Behind me is a bronze serpent on a pole. And this commemorates an incident in the wilderness wanderings. The people were being bitten by snakes and they were dying like flies. And so God told Moses to make this metal serpent, put it on a pole, and whoever looked at it would live. They'd recover. Now, uh, this indicates that God is very interested in our health, happiness, the recovery from disease, and of course, especially prevention of de disease is even more important. And so we can have a lot of confidence in the instruction that is given here. And let me give you a little bit more. Now, here is something that is perhaps more relevant to our modern world in Leviticus chapter 13 and in verse, verse 45. Now the leper on whom the sore is, his clothes shall be torn and his head bare and he shall cover his moustache or his mouth and cry unclean, unclean. And he shall dwell alone, his habitation shall be outside the camp. Now anyone has been inside a, a surgery, you know, when an operation is in progress, you see the doctors with all their, their coverings on their lips and this is to prevent the uh, spread of disease. We know that disease can be spread through what is breathed out of the mouth. And so here is some instruction that was along these lines. And uh, it lets us know that God knew what he was talking about way back there. Here's something else in our cholesterol conscious age. Leviticus 3 and in verse 17, this shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations in all your dwellings. You shall eat neither fat nor blood. Now we're just waking up to that today. And here it was thousands of years ago. Don't eat fat. It just builds up cholesterol in your arteries and veins and uh, it can bring on a heart attack. So here's some very up-to-date counsel, isn't it? Now, there is something that a lot of people think is very important for their happiness and that's the use of alcoholic beverages. But is it? You know, I think I've had a little experience in this. Uh, my father was a good man. I was brought up in an affluent home but he was a drinker. And I'll tell you, whenever he came back and had some drinks, there was a lot of very unhappy scenes in the home. And of course, alcohol also causes accidents, even a little bit. And it certainly is a drain on the pocket. There's a lot of reasons why we shouldn't be using alcohol. And it says over here in Proverbs 20 and in verse one, wine is a mocker, intoxicating drink arouses brawling, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. I think that's very relevant counsel, don't you? But there's always somebody who will raise the question, didn't Jesus turn water into wine at the marriage feast at Cana of Galilee? Yes, indeed he did. In fact, this is one of two churches in Cana of Galilee that commemorate the miracle. And inside this particular church, there is a stone jar and it's standing in front of a little water cistern and so this church commemorates the incident. It really happened, sure. But the question is, which type of wine? You see, there are two types of wine. We recognize that. You can either go into a liquor shop and buy a bottle of alcoholic wine, or you can go into a supermarket and buy a bottle of grape juice, which we sometimes refer to as unfermented wine. Now, in our society, these are two separate and distinct things. One is alcoholic and the other is non-alcoholic. But in biblical times, of course, they didn't label them on bottles just as clearly as that. When the grape crushing season came along, they crushed the grapes, got the juice, and for a few days it was unfermented. And then if you didn't do anything about it, then of course it became fermented. However, they had a system of boiling it, boiling it, boiling it until it became a thick syrupy juice and that would keep for up until nearly 12 months. And all you had to do was add water to taste. So there are two types of wine spoken of in the Bible. You have, for instance, in Isaiah chapter 65 and in verse 8, thus says the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one says, do not destroy it, for a blessing is in it. 
I, I like grape juice. It's a good drink, and there's a real blessing in it. But, of course, there's another type of wine which is condemned in the Bible. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 29. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long at the wine. Now, you don't need to wonder very long as just type, what type of wine is referred to there. Obviously, that is alcoholic wine calling, causing the red eyes and the wounds without cause and so forth. And so it says here, do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup. At the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Not only don't drink it, don't even look at it. Don't be tempted because alcoholic wine is harmful to the health. Now, let's take a look at the physical effects of alcohol on the human body. I want to talk to Dr. John Quinn of Sydney's large Westmead Hospital. Dr. Quinn has a degree in science, he has a degree in medicine, and he has a, a PhD in immunology, which makes him pretty well qualified to talk to us. Uh, Dr. Quinn, what can you tell us about the effect of alcohol on the human body? Yes, David, thank you. I can, I'll just go start off by just telling you some of the um, statistics associated with alcohol in medicine. For example, it's known that 85% of Australian men and 75% of the women drink alcohol in some form or another. Now, alcohol, even in minor amounts, can interfere with medications that many people take for minor illnesses. Now, the problem with that is that the effects are unpredictable, and this can lead to sleepiness, it can interfere with their ability to drive a car and perform various skill tasks. Now, even in moderate amounts, alcohol can exacerbate many med medical conditions that people have. While in excessive amounts, alcohol leads to a whole host of disease processes. Well, when somebody puts the bottle to their lips, what actually happens when it starts pouring down their throat? Yes, well, David, after they've taken their mouthful, obviously um, it goes down the main esophagus into the stomach, and there it goes on into the small bowel where it's largely absorbed from. Now, on the way down through the esophagus, it irritates the lining of the esophagus and also in the stomach it irritates the lining. Now this leads to pain in the long term and a condition called esophagitis or gastritis and bleeding. While in the small bowel, the irritation of the wall can interfere with the absorption of many important nutrients and particularly the B group vitamins. Is this a, is this a liver you've got there? What, what effect does alcohol have on the liver? Well, because of the arrangement of the um, anatomy in the body, the substances that are absorbed from the small bowel and the stomach, first of all, are taken to the liver. Now, the liver is a process, a storehouse and a processing factory in the body. And because of this, as the uh, alcohol is absorbed from the digestive system, it's the liver that bears the first brunt other than the lining of the uh, small intestine. Now, even a single episode of binge drinking, such as is very common on a Friday evening in Australian populations, can lead to a condition called fatty liver. As you can see in this liver here, this is a, uh, a, what's called a cirrhotic liver, which is a long-term consequence of excessive alcohol. But you can see these little fat globules, if I just point them out with my pen. The normal liver is uh, sort of smooth and homogeneous. And these little fat globules have replaced the normal liver tissue. As a result, the functions of the liver are interfered with. And in time, this can lead to serious disease. The person ends up a rather pathetic sight with a swollen, bloated stomach. They're unable to um, process many of the nutrients that are absorbed. And also, unfortunately, many of the toxins that come in the... Uh, in from the digestive system from the breakdown of proteins and the bacterial products. When they get to the liver, they're dealt with and um, detoxified. But if the liver doesn't work, well, then they get into the circulation and can interfere with uh, the, many of the body's functions. It's all pretty frightening. Now, what's this over here? Don't tell me that's a heart, is it? Uh, alcohol affects the heart? Yes. Now, unfortunately, the heart, too, bears a large brunt of uh, excessive alcohol intake. Now, the normal heart is about the size of your clenched fist. 
And if I compare my fist with this heart, you, even though this heart is opened up to uh, display the internal structures, you can see that this is a very large heart. Now what happens is that the alcohol acts as a toxin on the muscle cells and these muscle cells are unable to contract properly and as a result the heart tries to compensate uh, by getting larger and therefore allowing more blood to be uh, pumped in and out. Also the force of the contraction is better the larger the heart gets to a certain extent. In time this heart uh, becomes so large and dilated that the wall becomes very floppy and it's unable to pump the blood adequately through the body. And the person ends up with a condition called alcoholic cardiomyopathy. Well, it sounds like the long-term effects are pretty, disa pretty disastrous. What about the short-term effects? Yes, well, the short-term effects is something that's more relevant to the average uh, sort of Australian, since we can consider only about 10% of males about 3 to 5 percent of females eventually go on to become what we would refer to as chronic alcoholics. Um, the under age, the under seven, tw 17 age and even the under 25 year age group in Australia, they're a very large proportion of drinkers in Australia. And unfortunately, uh, just looking at the male population, about 30 to 40 percent of these uh, young men will eventually get into some trouble in their um, youth and their early uh, adulthood because of excessive alcohol. This may be in the form of a motor vehicle accident and despite random breath testing in Australia, still about 50% of fatal road accidents are caused by excessive alcohol intake. Then we have domestic violence. Alcohol is a significant tri tri contributor here the uh, person um, may be drinking and is unable to control many of their normal uh, emotions and this can lead to violence, uh, which is a rather dreaded and unfortunate thing that we see in Australian community. So your advice, I presume, is keep off the bottle, eh? Even in moderate drinking, what do you think? Yes, even in moderate drinking, Particularly um, in females, for example, I mean, it's been shown that uh, if in a woman that is pregnant, even one or two standard drinks a day can lead to a condition called the fetal alcohol syndrome, in which the poor, unfortunate newborn child is mentally and physically handicapped for the rest of their life just because of their mother's excessive alcohol during the pregnancy. There is something else that Moses wrote just before he climbed Mount Nebo. You'll find it in Deuteronomy 29 and in verse 18. Listen. And that there may not be among you a root bearing bitterness or wormwood. Some translations put it that there may not be a poisonous herb. Now there's quite a few poisonous herbs growing in the world today and unfortunately some people are using them to their detriment. For instance, there is the tobacco leaf and you've only got to Look at a packet of cigarettes and read it here. Warning, smoking is a health hazard. And according to the latest government regulations, the tobacco companies have to be even more specific than that. It is a deadly poison and it's not wise to use it. I talked with Dr. Russell Butler, who is a consultant physician, about the effect of smoking on the human body. Tobacco has a lot of effects on the human body which we've been aware of for oh, maybe 30 years since the first reports were made of an association between smoking, particularly smoking cigarettes, and lung cancer. You know, a cigarette is really very much like a chimney. And if you were to get on the end of a chimney and inhale the smoke, you'd expect it to be fairly nasty on the body. Now if you look here at this picture of a normal lung, you'll see that it's pink with a few specks of black on it, which are just from the normal dust that we see in the air. But this specimen I've got in the bottle here shows the blackening which happens when someone smokes regularly over a protracted period of time. Now, the person who did this had the consequences that they eventually developed a lung cancer and this pale patch of tissue here is the cancer which eventually led to them having to have this lung removed. 
Beyond that, they have a patch of pneumonia because the air passages in the lung have been obstructed by the development of this cancer. And it's been well known for a long time now that people who smoke, particularly people who smoke cigarettes, are likely to have something about a 20 times increased risk of developing lung cancer. The other effects of smoking, however, are perhaps not so evident and not apparently statistically so great. For instance, people also develop heart disease and we've got some pictures here of the inside of blood vessels which show the deposition of cholesterol and other material which tends to block up the arteries. Now, statistically, the increase in risk of developing heart disease due to smoking is only about two or threefold. But when you think that nearly a third of the population eventually dies of heart disease, it's very much more common than is lung cancer. And so the influence of smoking in accelerating heart disease is in fact much more important as a public health problem than is lung cancer. But there are other poisonous plants around besides tobacco leaves, you know. I want to talk to Don Bain, who is the director of the health department of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the South Pacific region. Don, what can you tell us about marijuana? David, I guess we could tell you a great deal about marijuana because this is a very old drug. It's been used in eastern countries for thousands of years. It has in recent decades been discovered by people in Western society and many people think that this is a, a very innocuous substance, but it's not. It's actually a very subtle drug. It appears to be virtually harmless, but its effect upon the body are, are really only starting to be understood now as we're doing more research. Marijuana is a mood-altering drug and it affects our concept of uh, time and space, our judgment, and uh, for people who drive or engage in any activity, whether they may be using machinery or flying aircraft or doing things like that, a marijuana can be a very serious drug. So the advice is leave it alone, I don't even experiment with it. I would say definitely so, that this is not a drug to be played with and uh, I think we'd be much better in our society without it. What about the plants that produce caffeine? Well, caffeine is an interesting substance too. It's been around for a long time. It's probably one of the drugs that is most used in, uh, in the world, actually. Now, you find caffeine in a variety of substances. Coffee, of course, is a major source of caffeine for millions of people. Tea also. The cola drinks have uh, quite a lot of caffeine in them. And there are alkaloids, which are similar to caffeine, to the abromine, etc., which you will find even in chocolate. But caffeine is a drug that uh, people use for a stimulant to give them a lift. And again, uh, people may think that this isn't uh, dangerous, but again, evidence shows that uh, too much caffeine can have a very deleterious effect upon the body. Uh, does it have any relationship to stress? Well, people will take caffeine, as in fact they will take a lot of drugs to uh, overcome the stresses of life. You know, people are always looking to chemical crutches. You know, if you've got a problem, let's open the medicine chest and find a pill or potion. And that's why people tend to be into alcohol, into marijuana, into caffeine, into many of these things to try and either block life out or make life a little more exciting or something like that. And I really think that when people are looking to uh, chemicals to solve their problems, they're really fooling themselves. And even with caffeine, uh, that this can have a, a serious effect actually upon oxygen levels to the brain, it can affect our motor performance. So I really think that if people are looking for drugs to help them with stress, they're looking in the wrong direction. People would be much better looking to a balanced lifestyle, getting a balance in the social, mental, physical and spiritual areas. These are the sorts of things that people should be concentrating on. Now medicines and drugs in that area have some place in society but they've got to be governed, they've got to be controlled by competent people. But we've gotten into this habit of self-medication and uh, people are taking so many pills and potions and drugs and all sorts of substances to try and help them cope and I really think that this isn't a positive way to behave. So it's best to keep away from the regular cup of tea. Well, I think even that, you know, people may get some comfort from it, but even the, the, the cup of tea that people think is, is quite harmless, that uh, drug authorities, for instance, in New South Wales and health authorities have shown that 
beyond five cups a day, for instance, that's been considered even by the, uh, the health authorities in this state to be a, uh, a health risk. So, uh, you know, I think that we need to be very careful taking these sorts of substances into our body. Now, let us talk about what we eat. Now, you know, the Bible tells us to look after our bodies. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and in verse 19, it says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So not only your spirit, but your body belongs to God and God expects you to look after it. And more specifically, it says in 1 Corinthians 10 and in verse 31, Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Carolyn Laredo is the, an officer in the diet office of a leading Sydney hospital, so she'll be a good one to talk to about dietary matters. Uh, Carolyn, just how important is diet to health? Well, there's an adage that's very appropriate to answer that question, David. We are what we eat. Diet is extremely important to our health. Um, really, what we put into our bodies is what determines what we can get out of them. And what are the principles of a good diet? Well, there's a lot of things that contribute to us having a good diet. It's important that we have regular meals, that they be set at a time suitable for each particular individual. Mm -hmm. We need a lot of variety and we need to be aware of things like obesity, um, particularly because that is a, a very big problem in our society today. Um, we need to decrease fat, sugar, alcohol and salt. We're finding that a lot of people at the moment are having far too high an intake of these things and we need to increase our dietary fibre and have a lot of fruit and vegetables. Fresh fruit and vegetables are the really the best things that you can eat. I'm sure. We need a variety, which is the big thing in a vegetarian diet. We, that is, cannot be emphasised enough because without variety, you are not including everything that your body needs. But the vegetarian diet with that variety does include everything. But of course good health is not only a matter of abstaining from what is harmful, it is doing what is good. And that not only involves having a good solid diet, a good healthy diet, everything is involved. You should have good rest at night, you should breathe plenty fresh air, drink plenty fresh water, and I think that exercise is also an important element for good health. Not bad for an old fella. <laughs> well, my son beat me again, of course. He usually does these days. But I got my exercise, and I really enjoy a game of tennis. And I think the reason I can keep up with my boys is because of my lifestyle. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't use tea or coffee, and I've got a wonderful wife who turns on some great vegetarian meals, and I really get the most out of life. Well, what about you? Do you have something there that should go? I think uh, we've all got to get a good lifestyle, you know, and if there's anything that you need to get rid of, well, why not get rid of it now? You'll not only live longer, but you'll get far more out of life. Unbelievable. Now I'm going to let you into a little secret. David's into his 70th year, so maybe that healthy lifestyle really does pay dividends. Have you ever noticed that our Jewish friends are usually quite prosperous folk? Well, I don't know the secret of their prosperity today, but I do know the secret of the prosperity of Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation. In our next program, we'll be visiting Ur of the Chaldees, Abraham's hometown. We'll be investigating his finances and revealing the exciting story of Ur, how it was lost, forgotten, and found again recently by archaeologists. It's a really interesting story. Why don't you join us then? <laughs>